Okay. Um, what percentage of viewers are subscribed? I don't know. I have a remarkably low number of YouTube subscribers. I think I have like somewhere in the realm of a hundred or something, which is kind of crazy given that, you know, I've been putting up videos and stuff for like years to hundreds of students, but I'm happy with that because every time I accidentally upload something stupid, um, <laughs> someone finds it if they're subscribed, so usually it's not a great idea. Um, to the people who are sharing particular issues with the labs, um, I, I can't, I'm not going to debug labs here in the lectures. If you have issues, please, uh, please post on the forum. Uh, that would be ideal for me, so um, I, ca I can't really sit here and solve lab problems during the lecture. Um, okay, so uh, today we are going to start on week two's topics. Um, there are seven small pieces of work to go through in the lectures today. And um, tomorrow we're going to do a little bit, uh, for the first 10 minutes, uh, a little activity I'm going to try called Teamwork Tuesday, where I tell you an interesting story or two, um, and we'll see how that goes. But for today, we're, we're going to go through uh, a lot of Git, and we're going to start making our way through Python. Tomorrow we will then finish off the Python and talk a little bit about project management and Agile and some of those other things that um, you know people have been interested in when it comes to... Uh, you know how actually how teams actually function. Oh God. Okay. So, so, um, just before we get into it, um, a cup quick a couple of quick reminders. So the first one is that uh, it's really imperative, and I just want to stress this a hundred times. It's really imperative that if you are having issues with your group throughout the term, then it's important that you raise that with the tutor during the term, if this makes sense. Um, I just want to flag this now. Hopefully none of you are having issues with your group. It's the start of week two. Um, but if you do run into issues over the next few weeks where you, you're kind of struggling to get along with someone or you feel like people are doing too much or too little, then go and just chat to your tutor. Send them a quick email um, is the best option. And they will help you out. And most importantly, they will take notes of it. Because one thing that happens a lot is that students finish the term, they get all their marks back, and then they turn around and say, hey, actually, my group was really crappy. I want a higher mark now. And, like, we can't do that. So um, it's really important that you um, do your best to actually talk to your tutor throughout the term if you run into issues, which the majority of you won't. The second thing I just want to remind people of is that um, in the notice I posted on Saturday, um, for the project... Um, I put a link to a spreadsheet. You can see it in the notice. And <laughs> it's like Bitcoin today for you guys on the chat, isn't it? Um, does anyone own any Bitcoin? I hope you do, for your sake. Um, there's a link on the notices uh, page. And it links you to this, like, 21T1 groups. Um, this is our master sheet of groups in the course. And the reason I point this out to you is um, so that you can double check that everything is good in, like you're in the right group and you, you're in the right, like everything's okay. If there's any discrepancies between what we have on this list and what you think is true, then um, uh, email me or your tutor, because um, we'll sort that out. But everything should be pretty stable now in terms of groups and you should be able to go to um, the, uh, the tute this week and everything will be fine. Great. Um, I don't think I have any other updates. I think the only other update is uh, please don't message me on Microsoft Teams. I won't reply to it. Um, email me or post on the forum if it's not a me specific thing. Okie dokie. Let's get into Git. So um, when it comes to Git, last week, particularly on the Monday, we went through a bit of like a, you know, this is how you add and you commit and you push and you pull. And you do a, we did the basics of kind of how to work alone. So if you think about it, what we were really doing last week was the version control part of Git, which is the, um, you know, like the keeping track of what you've done, right? Like a history of what's happened. And what we're talking about today is a little bit more in terms of how to, how to like two people or two or more people actually work together using Git as a tool to collaborate. Um, if you haven't done lab one yet, it's already due, so uh, rip. Um, so how do we use Git as a tool to collaborate? 
and this is really relevant for um, your project in particular because most of the labs in this course just require you to, to demonstrate a basic understanding of Git that you've already demonstrated in week one, right? Like commit, add, push, like add, commit, push, sorry. Um, but when it comes to the project, you'll actually have to start working uh, in teams, which is really <laughs> important. So <clears throat> this this lecture itself is not a bunch of slides. It's, it's more a demo to do with branching and merging is the key thing. But if you want to learn more about Git, which, which is a great thing to do, um, there are a few kind of big online sources of information on it. Atlassian has a big one. Um, and I think that it's so big mainly because they own one of the biggest Git repos, right? So like as a company, if you have a Git repo, you want to put out lots of blogs and articles about Git because then it, it helps bring people to you. But yeah, you can see here that they have this big article, where, a big series of articles where um, they'll take you through stuff. And I think the most important thing about the, uh, the Atlassian guides and other similar guides is that beyond all of the basics, they actually give you a lot of very visual demonstrations of what's happening. Um, so this is a great place to go if you're kind of like, okay, I get, I get the practical element of typing it in and something happens, but I'm not exactly sure what the hell is happening. Um, so Catherine, uh, Catherine's asked a good question, which is, is what we learn from places like Bit, uh, like GitLab and stuff and Bitbucket applicable to GitLab? Yes, they're all the same. Um, so it's a little bit like you can learn Linux commands and they'll work on like a Linux machine or a Windows subsystem and they'll work on a CSE machine. They're all kind of running the same system. They're just kind of different wrappers for it. So let's, let's get into it though. So, um, what I've done here is I have created a copy of the project in my own, in like a Git repo in my account. So there's my Z number and um, this is like a repo I made called week two backend, but it's exactly like your group project. So my Git history here is the same as yours would be if you looked at the commits for your, um, uh, t -t 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 what would you call it, um, project. Uh, the main difference is you'll see here that um, most of you would have played around with the lab, so you'd be familiar with the pipelines. Um, my pipeline here says pending, right? And you, you've probably seen um, you've probably seen this where like you you have these pipelines um, that run and they kind of say a bunch of things like uh, it'll be like it'll start with like pending, which is like the you know the two vertical lines, then it'll be like running, which is the moon, and then it will be well, the, I think it's the moon. Then it'll be like success, which is the tick, and it'll be like fail failed, which is the cross. Right, like the big X. Um, so just to be clear, um, and we'll get into this in later weeks, but you'll see on my GitLab repo here that mine is stuck in pending. And that's because all of your Git repos actually use a common server to run all of that, uh, that pipeline stuff. And um, that all exists within the comp1531 repo. So you see how like, because I'm not in slash comp1531 slash something, it's actually basically like, hey, I have some, I have some like tests that I want to run, but I don't know where to run them, and we'll, we'll probably talk about that in, in a little bit. We might loop back to that, but let us show you some basics of how you work together as a group. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to git clone this into my um, GitLab, and what we're going to do in this lecture is we are going to use a second terminal, which is my home terminal. So this is like. This is like the one, my local machine terminal here. And this one on the left is VLAB. Now I've colored them black and white um, just so that we can distinguish them easier visually. And I've also given this one a different name, hopefully. So we'll see if that works. But what I'll do here is I will git clone this repo called week two backend. And remember, this is just a copy of the project backend. So whatever we do here, you could, you could actually emulate with a friend on the project backend repo. So I'm going to git clone that to VLAB. Um, and we'll call this one black terminal and this one white terminal. So now I go into week two backend and you can see I'm inside my git repo here. I can git status. It says everything's up to date. 
Um, I can have a look around. I have my source and my test folders. I don't know what... Uh, what editor is... I'm not sure what editor exists on... Um, not editor. File Explorer. The name of the File Explorer is on... Oh, week two backend. It's back here. Um, yeah, so you can see I've got these files, right? I've got the readme, I've got the pytest.ini, um, I've got the tests and the source. Now, as you know, um, in your project, if you've gone and read the specification, as part of iteration one, we give you a very strict set of processes to follow when it comes to doing, like basically implementing the, uh, the work. And you can see step one is create a new branch. Step two is write, so we create a new branch, which we'll talk about what the hell that is in a sec. Step two is to write tests for that feature and commit them to the branch. Step three is to then implement the feature. Um, and then uh, duh, duh, duh. step four is make any changes to the test, blah, blah, blah. Step four and five are kind of, um, we'll, we'll come back to that. And then step six um, is to actually get it ready to come back into master. So. How it, how it really works, just at a, a high visual level, is you have to think about a major, like when you're in a project, your master branch is kind of like this main piece of code that's like, you know, there's just changes happening to it all the time, right? Now you're familiar with master, it's that thing where your code is. Now when you work in a group, what you're often doing in a conceptual sense is that if you want to do some work, let's say you have work uh, X, Y, and Z to do like this, and maybe like A and B as well. If you're in a team, what you do is you actually break away from the master branch, you go work on X, finish it, and then you merge it back in. And then maybe you'll go and work on Z, and then merge it back in. And while you're doing this, one of your team members might be working on, say, feature Y, and they might do uh, work on it over here and then merge it back in, and then they might work on feature A and they might merge it back in. Because the idea is that if you think of master, right, which we'll, again, we'll talk about branches in a sec. If you think about master, it's like the main uh, piece of code. And, and what branching effectively is, is you saying, I'm kind of going to take a copy of where the code's at. I'm going to go and work on it over here. And then when I'm done, I'm going to bring it back into master. So um, we will talk about... Uh, and in fact, if you actually remember, at the end of the... Um, at the end of the solo usage lecture last week, do you remember how we kind of did that thing where we had two terminals, but it was the same person, and they were basically just pushing commits to master all the time? Um, you could do that, right? You could just keep pushing commits to master all the time, but the problem is eventually it's kind of like, um, you know, just when two people try and work on the same thing at the same time, you're eventually going to run into some problems. Um... And I guess Patrick will get to your question too. So let's just let's just do an example. So let's say that I've just started the project and I'm I'm the black terminal and what I do is I type in git status. Now git status gives me the usual information here on branch master. If I want to figure out what branch I'm on, I can also type in git branch. Git branch shows me all of the branches that I have on my local machine, and then it also um, Will sh like it'll show me what branch I'm currently on, right? So uh, Sarth asked a question, which is, do we need to SSH for CSE and local machine? Um, you don't need to SSH for local machine. It's a very broad question, but that's a very broad answer too. So, um, what does this Git repo look like at the moment? Well, when we have a look at the commits, you can see that there are three commits here. So what I will do is I'll go back to paint um, and I will erase this and we'll make three little commits and we'll call it master, right? So I'm going to, I'm going to make this uh, my master branch and on the master branch, we've got three commits, one, two, three like this. Um, and we'll just call them like, we'll just call them like they had three different commits, which is like, it's the old commit one, it's the old commit two, and you're gonna have commits like this on your um, repo because I've had to push code to actually get your, um, uh, like to get this together for you, right? So um, you're gonna see that on your Git history. 
Catherine says, what happens if someone in your group makes a change that breaks the work that X group makes? Do you have to work on different areas? That's a good question. Let's loop back to that one because um, I think it'll be easier once some more concrete things are done. So this is our master branch. Now, if you'd like to create your own branch, think of it like your own version of the work, right? I want to have like my own version of the work and I might call this work uh, like what's the first thing we want to implement here actually that's a good question so maybe you as a group have sat down and thought okay how are we going to break up the work and then me Hayden is in charge me like the black terminal is maybe in charge of um, what feature let me think um, I don't know what's a really it's a really boring one it's like easy to do. We could just do the echo one. Maybe I'll just do the echo one so that we're not kind of giving away things in the, uh, uh, what would you call it? Like just, you know, giving you answers. So I'm not going to open VS code here today just because um, I don't have a lot of screen space. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, create my own branch because I want to work on the echo function. The echo function is the one we talked about on Monday, which essentially just repeats itself. Um, we talked about it last week, sorry, specifically. So if I want to work on Echo, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new branch. Now, how do you create a new branch? First thing, what are we going to name a new branch that we create? Well, a good naming convention typically is that you write your name and then you write what you're doing. So it's like who you are and what you're doing. So that might be Hayden um, Echo. Okay. Now, Echo is the feature or the piece of work that I'm doing, and Hayden is my name. And if I want to create a new branch, what I do is I go git checkout dash b um, Hayden slash Echo. Now, git checkout is this horrible git command which has like three different purposes which can make it very confusing. But for now, um, what I want you to understand git checkout as is git checkout is how you move between branches. So if there are multiple branches of work in your repository, git checkout is how you kind of toggle between them. Now, your terminal is only capable of looking at one branch at a time. I think this is a very conceptual mistake some people make. Um, your git repo might have many branches, but you can only look at one at a time. It's a little bit like... Um, they, they, were in, they were in lab one, yes, but, you know, I could talk about this every week and some people will still be confused by it. So it's, uh, it's good to keep reiterating. Um, branches are kind of like user accounts on a computer. You can make many of them, but you can only really log into one at a time. So this is how I make my own branch. I say I want to check out a branch, but because it's a new branch, um, I have to give it the dash B command. If I don't give it the dash B command, what I'm basically saying to Git is, hey, can you go and like log in or check out this other branch? And Git will be like, sorry, but I can't find that. It doesn't really exist. So we give it the dash B command, right? Dash B. And now we're on a new branch called Hayden slash echo. Now, when I type in Git branch again, I see that there's two branches, Hayden echo and master. And because the Hayden echo one is green, it's telling me that's the one I'm I've checked out. That's the one I'm logged into. That's the one that I'm working with at the moment. Now, oh no, my alarm's going off on my phone. Why is my alarm going off at 12.25 p.m.? Okay, one sec. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. That is interesting. It's my backup alarm, I guess. So um, I've got my Hayden Echo branch. Now, what happens when you check out a new branch in Git is that it actually copies the history across from the branch that you are currently on. So if you remember, when I went to repository here, uh, <laughs> when I went to repository here and I went to commits, you saw that on the master branch, see how this is master, that um, there were three commits. Now, when I git checkout B uh, and I create a new branch, what actually happens is that everything is copied. So on my new branch, I have the exact same commit history. And you can actually see that, right? Like, let's have a look at this together. So if I go git log here on the branch Hayden Echo, 
you'll see that I have three commits. Commit one, commit two, commit three. And these are the same commits you'll see here in GitLab. If I want to swap back to the master branch, I can just do git checkout master. Now notice I don't have to do the dash b in this case because um, it already exists. The dash b is to create a new branch. So I do git checkout slash b and you'll note, uh, sorry, I do git checkout master and you notice when I git log it has the same history. So this is interesting now because what actually, um, what I can now do with Hayden Echo, if you'll notice, I'll go back to Hayden Echo, is I'm going to make another commit. You, you can rename branches. Um, yeah, it's not a fun thing to do. Generally, if you, if, you, if you don't like the branch name, just live with it, um, is my advice for now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to actually do what the project instructions tell me, and I'm going to create a, like write the test, right? So what are the instructions? Every time I want to build a feature, create a new branch, tick, write a test for that feature and commit them to the branch. Okay, so I have to go into uh, nano, I'm gonna use this in nano, I'll use gedit for you guys, um, test slash echo test. And it says that I'm gonna write another test. So what I might do here, now in reality, obviously this test has been, these tests have been written for me. Like if you're actually working on this, there's gonna be no tests here. But let's just pretend that I'm having to add my own tests. So I'll say uh, def test echo uh, long. Uh, maybe I wanna test some really long strings. And I'm gonna test a couple of really, really long strings and the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to use some of the Python knowledge that we learned last week. And I'm going to say, I'm going to assert that if I try and echo uh, maybe like 800 times by a thousand, because remember what happens is when we multiply a string by a number, we get that string repeated that number of times. So I'm going to check if when I echo that, I also get the same thing. And I'll do that twice. I'll, I'll do this for a different string like ABC. So now I've written some tests, right? Which is cool. Um, and uh, that's like step two. Well, that's half of step two. So the other half of step two is to commit those tests. So if I git status, it tells me the files that I've modified and then I can git add those test slash echo test. And then when I git status, it tells me that it's ready for these files to commit. Um, and then I can commit them and I can say uh, testing longer strings for echo because that's what I was doing. So I'm going to describe the work that I'm doing and now I've committed that. Now, remember when we talked about commits on Monday, it was like every time you make a commit, it's like taking another snapshot. So I just did a commit here and it was like, oh my God, that text is so big. Um, and I'm just gonna call this one echo test because that's what we did. We wrote tests for echo. Um, and that's our next commit. And you can actually see that here in the git history too. So watch what happens when I git log this. Git log. So you can actually see I've got my first, second and third commit that like Hayden did. This will always be on your repos. And then the fourth commit that like I've done right now in the black terminal. And you can see that for God knows what reason my email address here is a, a at a.com, right? Taylor's asked a good question, which is, do you have to import PyTest? So people might have noticed that um, at the top of this file, there's import PyTest. You only have to import that library if you're actually using it. And I am using it down here for some stuff to do with exceptions, which we'll be talking about today, I think tomorrow or today. I think it's tomorrow. Um, but no, in general, you don't have to import it unless you're actually using the library. So... Um, if you do import it and you don't use it, nothing bad will happen. Um, but yeah. Okay. So um, let's have a look at this. You, I have four commits, one, two, three, four. Now let's check out master. Let's go back to master. I'll get log on master. You notice how my master only has three commits, right? That's because I did the work on a separate branch, like a separate login, a separate 
kind of account, whatever you want to conceptualize it as. So that commit only exists on my second branch. It doesn't exist on master. Now, also when I go to GitLab, take a look at this. When I go to branches on GitLab, you'll notice I only have one branch on GitLab, even though I created another one. Now, the reason for that you have to remember is that your GitLab uh, cloud is up here and your local machine cloud is down here. And the only times, this is, a, this is a simplification for you, the only times that these two things sync to each other are when you do a git pull and a git push. So you notice that everything I've done on my VLAB right now has just been adding and committing and branching. This is all happening inside of a bubble, um, but it's not yet synced with GitLab. The, the cloud up here so like this is GitLab and this is like um, this is oops, this is like VLAB or local depends which one you're using so now let's actually push it up to GitLab um, now so to do that I'm gonna go back to my Hayden echo branch right have a look git status everything's fine it's actually quite interesting. If you pay attention, if you start to try and make sense of what these git commands are doing, um, then you know you can use git status a lot to see what's happening, right? Like git status says there's nothing you need to commit here. So um, I'm going to now git push this. Now when I type in git push, um, sometimes I'll get this kind of command that's like, I'm sorry, but um, like it wants you to do something now the reason for this is that some like different git versions have different ways of dealing with this but sometimes gets like hey can you just like do this explicitly the reason gets asking you to do this right now is because you have yet to push it to gitlab so the first time you push it to gitlab sometimes it wants you to be a bit more explicit but after that you can just do git push in the future so I just do git push and it's like whatever. Now remember you can ignore that x11 forwarding request failed on channel 0. All you have to do is pay attention to everything else which says it's up to date. Now you notice when I push this to GitLab it says it succeeded. Um, and then when I go back to GitLab you'll notice now we have two branches. Right, so we have two separate branches on GitLab. This is cool. This also means that we have two separate commit histories on each branch. So when I go to commits, this is our master commit history, which you know about. And then if we go back to Hayden Echo, this is the echo commit history, right? So you see how the different branches have different commit histories? Um, because they're kind of isolated in some way. So Breeze asks, do you have to git add every time before you git commit? Um, yes. There are faster ways to do it, but there's danger to that, um, and I would, I would hesitate. I, I would caution against that, and that's actually one of the topics that we have to talk about on our Teamwork Tuesdays. Um, but for now, yes, you have to git add before you git commit. Feng Yu says, if we modify the content in a new branch and I switch to the master branch without the commit, will my master see the change? No, it won't. Um, it, it won't see the change. Uh, they're think the branches are very separated, right? They live their own lives until you explicitly force them back together. And that's why we like to use them because, you know, you can go away and create a branch and work on it without constantly worrying about it. Um, but yes, the master branch is still three commits because we never made a commit on the master branch. Um, Tenet is asking, uh, what are they asking? They're like, hey, is git push set upstream origin Hayden echo is this the same as like git push uh, dash u origin echo yeah I mean most of these commands are do very similar but subtly different things the short story is that when you first push a branch to GitLab it often will get annoyed if you just try and git push um, so the first time you do a git push you'll often have to run one of these three commands up here um, sometimes you will notice that out of sheer habit, um, while I'm coding, I will often explicitly write out the branch I'm pushing to. So sometimes when I'm pushing to master, I'll just write like this. And when I'm pushing to, to hate an echo, I'll just do that. Um, 
git push is just the shorthand way of doing it, right? So these are like the full commands to push. It's like saying, I want you to push to GitLab on this branch. I want you to push to GitLab on this branch. Um, git push is just like a, a fast way of doing it. It's like saying, hey, can you just push the branch I'm on to the GitLab branch with the same name? Um, so yeah. <coughs> Uh, Praf has asked another great question, which is, is git add just for files you don't have on your git master, i.e. a new file? There's a bit of a longer answer to that, but the short answer is that you use git add when you would like git to prepare a file to commit, right? So when you do a git commit, git commits a basket of files, and to get a file into that basket, whether it's a file that already exists in the repo or it's a new file that you just made, you have to git add both of them. Right? Um, no, I'm not joining the Facebook team. Thank you though. So we're gonna get we're gonna we're gonna keep going through this example. We're not done yet. I've just been tangented by some questions. Um, Savesh, the answer is yes. So let's keep going through the examples. So let's hold some questions for a little bit. Um, what does our thing say? It says, create a new branch, write tests for the feature, and then commit, commit them to that branch. We've done that. So step one and two are done. Um, I pushed, but the instructions didn't say to push. So you can push as often as you want. You can push after every commit. You can push after 10 commits. It's totally up to you. I want you to think of pushing... Um, before your code is done, pushing is basically like backing it up in the cloud, right? So when you push code that's not done like what we're doing here, we're basically saying, yeah, let's just put a copy of it in GitLab in case my computer explodes. So step three is to implement that feature. Notice I've written the test first. So now I'm going to implement it. So I'm going to go into source.echo.py, source slash echo.py. And you see, I've got my echo function. Now, obviously, again, this one's already written for us, um, but there's this very simple function, so there's not much I can do, but what I might change is, uh, I might change just some variable names. But you'll actually go away and you'll, you'll, um, you'll do this. You'll write your tests, you'll come back, and you will um, write your implementation like this. Step four, like we've implemented it, and maybe we'll commit it now. So we'll say git status. You can always check what branch you're on. That's a very important thing. Every time you hit git status, make sure you're on the right branch. I'm going to git add that file. I'm going to git commit that file and say um, echo implementation finished. And then I'm also going to git push that back up to GitLab just to kind of back it up, if you will, again. So git committing seems to be taking a while. So I git push. That's going to push it up to GitLab. And now you'll notice that on GitLab, um, while my master branch still only has three commits, I have added another commit to my Hayden Echo branch over here. This one might be Echo implementation. Now, in reality, you could make many commits to get the test together. You could make many commits to get the implementation together. They don't have to be in one commit. Um, but you will see that while my master branch still has only those original three commits, my Hayden Echo branch now has those five. Um, so git commit dash am is strictly prohibited in the course. Um, so I'm not going to endorse it at all. Uh, There's a question which is, if we want to have different commit com comments, then we need to have multiple baskets. Uh, I don't know why you would want different commit comments. You can just write a bigger comment. Catherine says, but a push will only back up to the last time you typed commit. It won't pick up any work that you've done since the last commit. Yeah, so that's a great comment by Catherine. So basically, every time you push, you're syncing your commit histories with GitLab. But any subsequent work you do, like for instance, if I make a new, if I modify echo again and I add a new line that's like def pass, def pass to that just passes, um, this is not up on GitLab, right? So I've made a modification since the last commit. Um, and if I git push, 
it says everything's pushed to GitLab, but if I git status, you see that's still here. Because remember, and this is like a really important conceptual thing for a ton of people, git push and git pull are not syncing files. They're syncing commits and histories, right? So just because I've modified this file, git push is not pushing my code as it stands to GitLab. It is pushing the commit history. And this does not exist on a commit yet. Um, there's another question which I'll just quickly show you and we're going to talk about this um, uh, in a later lecture so I, I don't want to go into detail on it now um, but if you've ever like done a ton of changes and you would like to just kind of like like reset all your changes since the last commit you can type in git reset dash dash hard and what that will do is like since your last commit you might have gone and like modified all these files but not committed them yet if you just want to like wipe your code back to the last commit um, then you will that will do it for you and you'll notice when I get status that it's all back to normal not required it's just a common question and I'm not going to go through the explanation of it at the moment um, we're going to talk about uh, dash a dash m later so if you're using dash a m or dash a dash m for your commits it, like you shouldn't be scared when I say it's prohibited I don't mean that we're going to like tie a noose around your neck and hang you up in J17 or something like as a, as a sign for others not to do it. Um, you can do it if you want. It's just, it's bad practice and I will get to why it's bad practice. Um, so don't freak out, you know, that's fine. It's just, it's like, uh, I don't know, it, it's a bit like, um, it's a bit like having constant variables in C that are all lowercase or um, stuff like that. It's, it's, it's not going to break anything probably, but it, it can lead to uh, bad things. But we will talk about that in, a, in one of the Tuesday lectures. In the meantime, take my word for it. Um, yeah. Now, just to move this forward a little bit, I have pushed this up to GitLab. So I've got my two extra commits that I've done on my branch here. Now, that means that we've done step four make any changes to the test such that they pass the given implementation. Step four is basically saying you write your tests and then you write your implementation and then sometimes your implementation won't pass your tests. And what I mean by that is you might be here and you might run PyTest um, and it might fail. So in this case it succeeded, right? Because our tests all passed the code. But when you run PyTest, either your tests might be wrong or your implementation might be wrong. So step four is just saying, go and make sure those things are working together. Step five is just a reminder to add any assumptions to the assumptions doc if you've done so. Um, so that's all fine. Step six is where things get interesting. So step six is saying we have finished our work. You're like, I'm really happy with my branch. I think I've, I think I've, it's, it works. The tests are done, the implementation's done. I'm ready to kind of tie this off and submit it basically. And we do that through the creation of like a merge request. So I'll take you through this process and this one is pretty important. The way this process works is you, um, you make sure all your code is pushed up, right? So I'm going to git push. That was me doing that. You could just do git push. It's all pushed up and, and reasonable and you're happy with it and done. So on GitLab, you go to the merge requests tab here right on the left now GitLab will often prompt you if you've pushed a branch recently it will often prompt you and say you push something do you want to create a merge request but um, I'm going to show you kind of the the longer way um, but before we do that what is a merge request a merge request is a simple process whereby you have a main branch and like a development branch and you would just like to merge your new code into the main branch in this case master and you can actually do this on command line, but this is one of the few things that um, people will nearly always do visually through like an online tool. Because like a lot of people will do git on command line, even though it's a bit confusing, git status, git commit, git push. Um, it's kind of useful to do that on command line, but the actual act of merging two branches together um, will often happen via these G GUIs, GUIs, right? So I'm gonna create a new merge request which is a request to merge code in. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I would really like to merge Hayden Echo, my source branch, 
into master here. Now, one really important thing to know is that you see how, again, on my repo, I probably should have just made this in the, um, the comp 1531. I'm sorry about that. Um, it says pending. You should not merge your work into master while there is anything but a green tick here, right? So a green tick says, yep, my code's all fine. It's passed all the tests. Everything's great. Um, and then you can merge it into master. So in this case, let's just assume that it's green. So I click compare, compare branches and continue. I can give it a title. I might say finished echo implementation. Um, I can give it a description, um, which might be, you know, there's not much to this, but you know, blah, 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 blah. Assignee, <coughs> it doesn't need, you don't really need to touch much else here. Um, but a useful feature you'll see here is that it says delete source branch when merge request is accepted. So in a normal workplace environment, you will typically um, delete your branches as soon as they're merged in. And this is to stop a kind of branch sprawl where like there's like a hundred branches in the repo and no one knows what they do anymore. So the, the lifetime of a branch is typically only long enough to actually just like be merged back in. And once it's merged back in, you just want to like delete the Hayden echo branch. You don't need it anymore. So typically you'll have this ticked. Um, we'd encourage you not to tick it for your projects just because then you have a better kind of history of branches and stuff, at least for the start. Um, Praf has asked, is this another way of doing git merge? Yes, this is kind of the proper way of doing git merge, I would say. So I'm going to click submit merge request. Now, what I want you to think about this merge request is it's basically a, um, it's basically you kind of saying, hey, I, uh, I'd like to merge some code into master, right? Now, what you do with your team, and I'll, I'll just outline this process pretty quickly, is you submit a merge request, one plus other people in your team approve it, and you merge it back in. You merge it into master. Right? Like that. So now um, what you would do with your team members is that you've created this merge request. Tick. There's going to be someone else in your team who approves it. So you're in like teams of three to five, right? And you might ping them on teams. You might they might get an email about it, whatever. And what they do is they'll log on. So let's assume for a second that I'm um, uh, Taylor. Um, so like Hayden wrote this pull request, uh, merge request, sorry. It's called pull request in um, GitLab and Bitbucket. But on, on, um, on GitLab, it's called merge request, which I think actually makes a lot more sense. Uh, though, you know, it's just not something I'm used to. Um, so they'll come on and they'll look at it and they'll be like, okay, finished echo implementation. They'll read your description. Um, typically, this pipeline here will say passed or not passed. They'll look at your code. They'll be like, okay, they made two commits. Um, and these are the changes they made in the code. And you look at it and you're like, yeah, this makes sense. Yeah, sure. Sometimes you might want to comment on it and be like, uh, why did you change the variable name for no reason? you can click a button and start a review. Um, and you guys can like comment and, and work together on this, right? Um, so this is kind of re a review process. So you think about merge requests as a review process to get branches merged into master, right? Um, and once like, once uh, Taylor's happy with it, Taylor will like click approve, right? Now you in your team can make decisions as to how you want to do this process, but typically um, any person can approve it. And typically you need one approval to merge it, sometimes two, but like for the sake of your group projects, one is probably adequate. Um, so that's like the other person in your team approves it and then you merge it into master. And I just want to stress this one um, actually, I, I could do that. Um, Taylor, I don't know if you're... Uh, I can actually add you. Taylor, what's your... What is it? Taylor Chan? Is that your real name? Great. Okay. 
Um, so I've just added you to my git repo, Taylor, and if you just like go to this URL, um, you can actually like approve it, for instance. Um, so I just I just unapproved my code. So hopefully <laughs> you log into GitLab, Taylor. Hurry up! I don't have all day. Um, no, it's all right. Take your time. I'm just gonna have a look at some of these comments. Um, we're going to talk about code clashes. Yes, there are code clashes. That's the last thing we're going to talk about today. Um, and we'll talk about resolving them. Um, should we have our master branch and then a stage branch and we merge everything into stage and then fix the issues before merging into master? Um, that is a that is probably a good way of doing it. Um, and then someone also asked, didn't the last tutorial mention merging the master branch into your development branch, like Hayden Echo? Um, before we merge the branch into master. So you're all you're all asking excellent questions and the answers to pretty much all of these questions are like, yes, absolutely. Um, they're all true. So um, there's a lot to get. And, and again, I'm just going to reiterate this to you is that in the first week of Git, you feel like you haven't learned 80% of it's confusing. After the second week of Git, we want maybe like 50% of it to be confusing. And then, you know, as we do more and more of it, it's like 30%, 20%. So um, there are some great questions here. And most of the answers are kind of like, yes. Sometimes you do want to merge your master branch into your development branch. Um, that's perfectly fine. Uh, and, and we'll talk about that in a sec. But in general, just don't, don't be afraid again that if like there's something that isn't covered in this lecture in particular, and you encounter it, that it must be wrong because we didn't talk about it. Um, <clears throat> did did you go to my did you did you go to the repo I linked you, Taylor? Did you click on the link I gave you? Adams asked a great question, which is, what happens if you need to make further changes after you submit and merge a merge request? Um, typically, you'll actually just uh, start a new branch. Branches are a dime a dozen. You know, they're free, cheap. Um, you can make five a day, ten a day, whatever you want. So that's that's perfectly fine. You could reuse the same branch, but just for simplicity, I'll say you can always just make another branch if you want to. Um, I feel like I feel like I've I'm giving Taylor a great deal of anxiety right now. Could you actually see the GitLab link I sent you? Did that come up in the chat? The GitLab link. Maybe. I don't know. Can you undo a merge request? Not easily. Generally, generally Git is a is a very, very forward looking tool. Um, so generally with Git, um, you're like just looking forward and, and you don't often unwind it. Um, does someone else want to be added? Does anyone else here want to be added? Someone else just approve this for me. <laughs> Your opportunity to shine, Taylor. It's dwindling. First one to say, okay, Miguel, sure. Miguel, great. Beautiful. All right. You just follow the link and then someone can approve it. So this is like typical team of many people. Sorry, I know there's lag and people are at different times. Um... So Sarvesh has said, what file had the code in red? <coughs> so <coughs> in this case, red means you are moving it to master. So like, sorry, red means you are removing it from master and green means you are adding it. So this is trying to merge the Hayden Echo branch into master and it, red means the, the code that's removed um, and green means the code that's added. Um, I'll answer Kylie's question too. So um, we've got two approvals. So Miguel and Taylor has approved it. Now, um, the person who wrote the code should always merge it in. And the reason for this is because just because you approved it and you're happy with it, like it might be logical to think if I've approved it and Hayden is, can merge it in any time, um, why like... Why don't I, Taylor, just merge it in instead of Hayden? And the reason is because 
the person who writes the code typically has the best understanding of what the hell it's doing. That's the short answer. So the person who wrote the code is aware of the details of it. They probably thought about it more. So you leave the merging to the person who wrote it. So now that I've got these approvals, I will click merge. Um, bam. <coughs> and now what happens is on GitLab, if I go back to my branches, you'll see I have two branches, Hayden, Echo, and Master. But you'll notice that Master Sorry, I meant to click on commits. Master now has all of the same stuff, doesn't it? Where is it? Where'd it go? Why isn't it there? Did it fail? Oh, sorry. So it's waiting for this pipeline to finish before it merges, but the pipeline will never finish. So I'll just merge it immediately. That's the problem. That won't happen to you. So don't worry about it. <clears throat> so it's merged in now. I refresh the page, and here's the interesting thing. Here's the really weird thing about um, uh, here's the really weird thing about merging. Now, one of the problems with Git conceptually is that all of these branches that I showed you before, these were all VLab. These were all what the state of Git is on VLab. But you have to remember that Git, being a decentralized network, there's an entire copy of the repo, right? Both on VLab, like on your local machine or VLab, end up on GitLab as well. So what I mean by that is that this is this is where our VLab was up to, right? We created a branch, we added two commits, and we pushed them up to GitLab. When we pushed them up to GitLab, the merge requests that we did, right, they all happened up on GitLab. Our local machine, our VLab, is not aware of those changes. So what, what really happened here was when we hit merge, and we merged Hayden Echo into master, um, it does this thing where it not only adds uh, the two commits, but it also adds a uh, what's called like a merge commit, which is a little bit confusing, but basically think of it like a... It's basically like a stamp to say, yep, I've merged these things in. Um, so this is like the state of... GitLab. Oops, sorry. Yeah, my face is blocking. Thank you. Um, that was fun. Uh, so, like, if we go back to GitLab here, you'll see that... Have a look. On my master branch on GitLab, um, I have these six commits. And on my Hayden Echo branch, I have these five commits, right? But when I go back to VLab, notice that on my Hayden Echo branch, I have my five commits. One, two, three, four, five. Let me make this bigger. Um, I have these like, yeah, these five commits, one, two, three, four, five, but you'll notice that when I check out master and I git log, I only have three commits. And again, that's because your local git and the git on GitLab are both running full copies of the repository, and sometimes they get out of sync, and that's what pushing and pulling is. Pulling is saying, give me some history, pushing is saying, here's some history for you. So if I want to get that history on master, which I know it doesn't, uh, hasn't happened, then what I do here is I would check out master on VLab, which I'm already on, sorry, and then I would git pull, and git pull says, I want you to get me all the history on this branch that I'm missing and add it back here. Right, and now when I git log, you will see that I have one, two, three, four, five, six. So now like what that git pull action did was it essentially copied all of this stuff here. Like that. So that pulling and pushing is how things sync up. Um now do people actually need to run the code before clicking the approval? That's a question Richard's asked. So you saw that Hayden made a merge request with his code and that Taylor, um, how dare, uh, approved that without actually ever running my code. Maybe that's why Maybe that's why Taylor took so long, just trying to pull and run my code. Um, the question is, do you need to run someone's code before uh, it m is merged? The, the short answer is no, um, but you can. Like, So like I have employees at work and some of them, some of them I check their code, um, some of them I don't. 
like when I say I check their code, I mean like I'll read their code, um, but some of them I won't uh, run their code because generally I've the last fifty times I've merged their code, it's worked fine, right? So I don't want to be like you only need to review, you only need to check someone's code if you think they're stupid. That's not my point. Um, my point is in general, you probably don't need to bother until it, until like things become super unstable and then you're like maybe we should check each other's code a little bit more often now um yeah so what i might do now is we're gonna pause this recording um we'll take a five minute break and we'll finish this off with a bit more git before getting into the next lectures okay we have a lot to get through today um so Let's uh, let's take five minutes and then um, get back to it. So go get some water or do whatever you need to do. Okay, um, hey everyone, nice to see you after such a a long time apart. Um, a couple of questions have come up. <clears throat> this git this git thing is dragging on a bit, but that's okay. It's probably worthwhile. Um, someone said. Uh, if you merge on GitLab, you do it via a merge request. And if you do it on local or VLab, you can do it with like a command line. So we always merge on GitLab. Um, and the reason for that is because it's an actual process where you can review it and like see it and chat about it in a meaningful way. So um, you don't ever do local merges. It's all, all happens on GitLab. That's the oversimplification of it. Okay, so last couple of things we're going to chat about before we move on. Um, firstly, um, here, this white terminal that I've had on local, you'll notice that I cloned this before black terminal did any work today. So while black terminal has this branch, Hayden Echo, and while VLab has this branch, Hayden Echo, my, my terminal here doesn't have it, and it's like, if I try and check out the branch, Hayden Echo, um, I, get an, I get an error. Now, there's, there's a couple ways to solve this. One of them requires you to remember a process. The other one requires you to um, remember a, a new command. Um, what I would probably say is the easiest thing, easiest thing to do, and I'm sorry for introducing another git command, is there is a git command called git fetch, which we will talk about later. But what git fetch kind of does is it basically is like a... Uh, it, it basically gets your local environment ready with... Like, it gets it ready to check out new branches. I don't want to say it does a git pull on all the branches because it doesn't do that. Um, but basically, it, it kind of like half syncs with GitLab. And the, the main time for any of you to use it right now, and I, I don't think you need to use it at any other time, is if your team members have been working on a branch that you have yet to connect on your machine. So I'm going to git fetch, and you'll see what git fetch does is that it, it kind of just, it looks like a pull, but it's not really a pull. But what this allows me to do now is when I git check out Hayden Echo, um, I can actually just switch to it straight away. There's other ways to do this, but I think that's the easiest. Um, so the short story, if you're ever trying to check out a branch, which you didn't make and isn't like in your git branch list, do a git fetch before you check it out. Now there was one question over the break which said, um, is there any way that <coughs> we can practice this as you teach because I find it very tough to learn just by watching and listening. Um, so the, uh, the, the short answer is you can just try this out by doing the project because like literally everything I've done here you can just do on the project. So if you want to, you can watch the lecture again slowly and just go step by step. Um, Jonathan said, why wouldn't you just git pull? Um, if I was in the master branch and I tried to git pull origin Hayden Echo, it would try and pull Hayden Echo into my branch and lots of weird things would happen. Um, so yes, and we'll keep talking about Git. I know you all have a hundred questions. It's just we can't go into them all today. The last thing to show you is Git conflicts because you've seen this in the lab because it's part of the lab. We kind of teach it to you in the lab. Um, but I just want to give you a demonstration of where these these issues kind of happen. Let's imagine 
that two people, for some reason, modify the same file. Maybe it's auth.py, so we'll start off with that. On the black uh, terminal, I'm going to create a new branch called Hayden slash auth register. And on that branch, I'm going to modify auth.py. And I'm going to have this return. I'm going to add a new line that's like um, default return equals five. And then I'm going to change this to, uh, I changed the wrong thing, one sec. Um, I'm going to modify auth register so that I create a new variable called default return. And then it returns default return instead of one. Right? Simple enough. What I've got here on my paint, which I did over the break, is just the status of like three different Git repos. So we have GitLab on the cloud. We have uh, one person's local machine and another person's local machine. In this case, I'm using VLab and my local machine to, to show that difference. So what's happened here is on uh, VLab, I've gone and created another branch called um, Hayden slash register auth. Right? Um, oh, thank you. Sorry, video's in the way again. We don't need to see me. I'll just like just hide down here. Can we rotate me? Probably not. Okay. So um, I've created another branch here, and it was called uh, it was called Hayden slash uh, Register Auth. And I made some changes on that branch, and I'm going to git status, um, and then I'm going to add source slash auth, and I'll commit that and say like uh, default return on register, right? And then I've committed that, and because I've committed it, it's like I've made another um, branch here, uh, another commit, sorry. Um, and it was just like it was default something. Def <laughs> default. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, push it to GitLab because I want to merge this into master now, right? And I'm going to git push. Uh, when I git push, it's going to give me that complaint because I'm on a branch that has yet to go to GitLab. So if I'm feeling lazy, I can just copy and paste that command. And then after doing the git push, remember what does git push do? Git push syncs your branch with GitLab's. Git Git push syncs your commit history on that branch with GitLab's commit history on that branch, and it does this. So now GitLab is aware of that branch. While this is happening, this local white terminal has no idea any of this is happening, and they might have gone and started their own branch um, called, uh, I was going to name it the first thing I saw in the chat, but it was Cyber Knob, so that's not very fun. Um, I saw Tay giving Taylor some, some Jess earlier, so we'll call it Tay. Um, slash uh, channel channels. So now Tay is going to create a branch called uh, Tay slash channels, and that branch is Tay maybe going to modify some channel stuff. So what Tay then does is uh, Tay's got Tay slash channels like this, um, and then Tay is going to come along and say, um, I'm going to modify channels.py, and I might modify this one to be two, and Tay's favorite channel. So Tay's just modifying code. I'm just, the focus isn't on the code modification. It's on like the Git stuff. So I'm just doing this really loosely. And then for some reason, unknown to me, um, Tay decides to update the auth user ID from one to um, 887. Okay. Um, and then Tay's got these two files. So Tay's going to now commit them. Tay's going to add source slash auth. Tay's going to add source slash channels. And then Tay is going to commit those two things and saying uh, channels upgrade. And when Tay makes does that commit, what happens is that another commit is added on this branch that Tay's working on. And that was called like um, you know some kind of channels committing. Um, and now Tay wants to push it to GitLab, um, but actually before Tay pushes it to GitLab, let's just let's just pause there. So Tay hasn't pushed this to GitLab yet. The next thing that VLab black person does is they go on to GitLab and they say, hmm, okay, well, I'd actually like to make a new merge request and I'm going to merge auth register into master, 
great. They submit the merge request. Um, does, does one of Miguel or Taylor want to approve it? It's on the same repo. Someone can quickly approve it for me because I shouldn't merge code in unless someone's looked at it and approved it. I'll give you 10 seconds. <laughs> hey, okay, Miguel got there first. So, uh, Taylor, Taylor, classic. <laughs> so now what we want to do is we want to merge that in immediately. So what, <laughs> what this will do is on GitLab again, this will take the, the work I've done on my branch. It will merge it into master. <laughs> Oopsie. Um, it will merge it into master. And then it will do that standard um, extra commit that you saw as well. The like merge commit they're called. Now, now we have this problem, and this is quite a conundrum because, you know, the VLAB black person, they've done their work, they've gotten there first, um, you know, seems fine. Uh, you can see, by the way, notice how that master branch in VLAB black is not up to date. So if I wanted to on, if I wanted to get the latest master, I have to check out master, and then I have to git pull to get those changes from GitLab. So while all of this has been happening, um, Tay over here on the on my local terminal has just been chilling, working on their branch. And then Tay goes, you know what? I'd actually really like to merge my channels code in. I'm really happy with it. So Tay now goes to push her Tay slash channels branch because it's a branch that doesn't exist on GitLab. <coughs> Tay has to run that command, pushes it. Um, and remember what happens is, is when you do that, you're syncing your git commit history on a branch with GitLab. So now GitLab is aware of that branch existing, right? Um, notice how VLAB black is not, right? It's not really here. Um, I'd have to do the fetch and all that other stuff first. So now what happens is Tay goes, my awesome code, I'm going to go merge it in I'm going to go create a new merge request. I'm going to, by, by the way, obviously Tay would be doing this on a, on, on their GitLab, not, not on my GitLab. Um, but let's just try it out this way. Uh, so we got Tay slash channels, compare and continue. This all looks good. Untick delete source branch. I click submit merge request. And then, and then this is like, this is like your unhappy place in life. It says merge, there are merge conflicts. Resolve conflicts on merge locally. Now, GitLab's actually pretty powerful at doing this these days. You can actually log into GitLab and choose which change you want to make. So I'll let you guys figure that out as you go because that one's super easy. But I'm going to assume for a second that you've come across a more difficult merge that you can't do on GitLab and you have to do on the terminal. So Tay creates this merge request, starts pulling out their hair and goes, damn it. I'm going to have to merge this locally. Yeah, boo, boo. Can I re emoji react to that? Can I have a basketball? Um, <laughs> no, that's mean. We'll level that out. So um, now what's Tay going to do? Well, this is the interesting thing. So this is the, this is the process you'll follow. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. So if you don't fully get it, you might just have to go back and watch it later. Um, I'm going to, because I'm trying to merge Tay channels into master, right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to first check out my master branch. And I'm going to, to do that work, to check out master. And I'm going to pull from master. Now what this will do is this will pull from GitLab, right? And it will update the new commits here on the master branch. So that's the first step. You make sure your master is up to date. Now I'm going to go back to Tay slash channels, right? And what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and merge master into my branch, right? This is to basically sync it up. This is just the process you follow. Don't overthink it. So I'm going to merge master into my Tay's channel, Tay channels branch. And then Git will give you this message. And sometimes this message will be very big depending on how much um, people have changed. Now, the only lines you need to worry about um, in this message are the lines that say conflict, 
and here it says conflict, merge conflict and source slash auth. Now what you do in these cases is you open auth.py and you will see git has spat out some funny code. You literally just have to, <coughs> um, I don't know what the, the, the modern word for manhandle is, but you basically have to manhandle this code together where you just, you, you just have to literally rip it apart until it looks like what you want. Now typically what happens in this case is that Tay has been like, damn it, Hayden has gone and put a variable here and I want it to be 887. So Tay doesn't just make changes. Tay goes, uh, Tay would typically message me on say Teams and be like, yo Hayden, what, what have you done? I wanted to do this and then we chat and then I'm like, well actually I don't care what the return value is Tay. I just wanted to make it into a variable because I thought that was cleaner code. So then you kind of come to this understanding and then, then what Tay might do is Tay might actually keep my pattern of putting it in its own um, variable, but just change the constant there. This is just assuming that's what Tay wants. So now we're like, everything has been resolved. Um, um, <laughs> yeah, sorry, Tay, Tay was gonna do this, I'm sorry. But so now that that's been resolved, I go to git status. Um, to be honest with you, to be perfectly honest, when you do git merges like this, generally this is probably the one time I think doing a git add all works, but like I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna add like the files manually for now. Git status, I'm going to git commit all those files. Don't overthink the commit staging stuff when you're merging, it's a bit confusing. Then I'm gonna say uh, uh, resolving conflicts with Hayden. Because I just did a git commit, that's going to add another commit onto um, my branch because I'm modifying my Tay, Tay channels branch. Um, and that, that commit name might be like, you know, that was like resolving or something. No, the terminals are not racist. It's just colors. Um, so now I'm gonna push Tay channels up. Now remember what pushing does is pushing syncs with GitLab. So I select this one and uh, that is basically me saying, hey GitLab, can you have this up to date? And now what happens is when I go back to my merge request and I refresh it, it's now ready to merge in. Because Git is capable of saying, well, I like, you know, I can merge this in now. Because the basic principle of Git is that the second it sees like code, like a branch, and then it sees like one person go off and do that, and then another person go off and do that, and then you're just like, hey, can we just like merge these together? Gets like, I don't want to do that. So we've kind of fixed up the history. Now, again, I'm not going to go into too much technical detail on that, but um, that's the crux of it. And when I hit merge now, that will merge it in on GitLab. So on GitLab, this will merge Tay stuff into master. Um, I've gone to a lot of effort here to actually draw out this git commit history. It's a little bit oversimplified. There's some things I've glossed over, but um, I hope that also explains, like notice how again, like the master of VLab and the master of the local are not in, like they're not in sync with GitLab and you kind of have to follow the processes. But um, but yeah, so uh, that's, that's, that's the crux of it. Um, I'm sure you have some questions but um, generally, generally I'm gonna try and move on to the next stuff. Again, if you come away from this and half of it makes sense, that's a good spot for you to be in. If it's less than that, I'd probably say you should maybe go watch it again, watch this lecture later. Um, yeah, Tay's the white terminal. Um, Bill G's asked a great question, which is how should you divide the work? That's totally up to you. That's actually one of the hard parts of the, well, hard parts, that's actually one of the, the challenges of the project is for you as a team to figure out how to break it up without stepping on each other's toes. It's, it's a genuinely interesting experiment. Um, Fang Yu says, can you commit in master and then push in order to solve the conflict? Um, in general, in a group setting, like in a group project, you never want to commit to master. You only ever want code to go into master if it's via a merge request in a, in a group setting. For your labs and stuff, it's fine. For solo projects, it's fine. But in, in like a group environment, you absolutely don't want to. Um, 
you can't use your local terminal to merge stuff on cloud. You do that via merge requests. Cool. So I'm gonna I'm gonna park that um, for now. So that's the end of the Git stuff. That pretty much should prepare you for the project, basically. Um, and some things will still be confusing, but we can keep chatting about them. Um, yeah.